collapse of its own accord unless dramatic reductions take place. All right, well, what will happen? What is the sequence of events? Well, we're going to see uh, something obvious, which is further degradation in the Americans, uh, uh, the, the American uh, credit rating. Um, it's not simply going to be uh, a, a recognition by credit agencies that we have poor credit. It's going to be a realization by those countries like Japan and China that have lent us money that we're becoming an increasingly grave risk for return on investment. So what are they going to do? Well, they're going to use the advantage politically to coerce and cajole us, to put us in a position where we uh, damage the relationships with our friends in order to uh, sustain the money flow from coming from these countries, and also put us you know, in, a, in, in, in a financial blackmail environment there. But also what's going to happen is that inflationary effects are going to eliminate the economic benefit of any of the benefits the government provides and also destroy the economy at the same time. There's no way that you can maintain this level of spending and inflation of the money supply and not have it reverberate into the market and cause extreme inflation. So we're going to end up with hyperinflation. We're going to end up with a diminution in the availability of uh, uh, federal benefits because of the fact that those who provide them simply cannot economically afford to provide them. Is, is that, Jonathan, why you think there has been a ramp up in activity at, at FEMA camps, why there's more talk of, of taking away the rights to protest, you know, uh, requiring a permit to protest? Is, is there an anticipation of a coming federal collapse that's causing the government right now to clamp down on rights ahead of time? Well, there is some of that, but there's also a view uh, by politicians which is very grossly irresponsible and that is that they can as long as they can maintain the spending spree for a time at least past the time that they retire from office they can leave it to somebody else to solve it that's basically the right. obama approach to this i he's not going to take the debt seriously because he anticipates that the 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 rubber is going to hit the road and and really destroy the united states after he leaves office from a second term and it's not a situation where any member of Congress, Republican or Democrat, with very few exceptions, is willing to do what is necessary to save the country. As a consequence, we have to commence and maintain a national movement that calls into question the actions that are taken that are unconstitutional, demands that the government be brought back in line with the constitutional requirements, and votes into office those who favor those positions, and demands from them essentially pledges to, uh, to achieve that end. Ultimately, the typical good American citizen who appreciates the necessity of this, many of whom are Tea Party people who've run for office in the past, uh, will have to run increasingly for office and take back the government. We have to be able to pass through legislation that will break down the government and will privatize entitlements. We need to go through a system of second bests I identify in the book where we start with this environment of second bests. We would have been better had we not gotten involved with Social Security and health, Medicare and Medicaid to begin with. But having gotten there, how do we wean the American public from it? And what I offer is a system of, of modifications of the corporate and individual income tax to achieve that. Part of my plan would eliminate the f individual income tax, phasing it out of existence. But during a transition period, I use tax uh, breaks for corporations to enable them to pick up responsibility and care for the indigent as we wean the government uh, of that role. But you're, you're, and, you're fighting against uh, total economic insanity in Washington. And as a great example of that, uh, the Weekly Standard carried a story Quoting Valerie Jarrett, who is a, a senior advisor to the White House, she says that people who receive unemployment checks go out and spend it and help stimulate the economy. So I guess in her mind and in many of those in Washington, the, the, the way to have abundance in America is to make sure that everybody's jobless and, and spending unemployment checks. Well, they advocate a nation of dependency, and they also create this deception for the poor. It's a kiss of death to the poor from the Obama administration that if they rely on these government programs, which incidentally will only take a fraction of them and provide them with anything of economic value, the rest are just given this blank promise which can never be fulfilled. But the notion that we will tax the country and redistribute the wealth to those elements of society that are indigent, uh, 
and not have an adverse effect upon um, un, uh, unemployment is, 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 is ridiculous. If you take from the most productive elements of society the reserve of wealth that they count upon for investment, saving, and innovation, you dry up the pool necessary to increase employment, increase private sector employment. And so the president would like to take those reserves of wealth and bring them to the government, uh, not articulating the fact that that's going to cause a dramatic increase in unemployment as these individuals are incapable of expending the money necessary to be competitive in the market. Sure. And at the same time, create these uh, superficial uh, uh, retraining programs and public works programs and more money for teachers and more money for police, which is a dead-end investment because you have to put that money back in there every single year from the government in order to maintain the pro programs. And furthermore, they're out, of, they're out of sync with the market. What we want is to liberate the market so that employment levels can increase and so that we can become a nation that is competitive with the rest of the world and that provides a growth in the economic pie instead of having a static pie that we continuously uh, carve apart and remove into the government sector. But again, but you're, the, Jonathan, you're coming at this from the point of view of being a rational person who wants to help the nation and help the people. And those in charge today who have the political clout and the power who make the economic decisions, the evidence is increasingly just readily apparent that they want to destroy this nation. I mean, so how, getting to the solution section, how do the citizens, how do the activists, how do the free people of America take part in a real, you know, a peaceful revolution of taking back their power and restoring sanity, economic sanity, among other things, to America? Well, there has to be a focal point, and many of the campaigns have provided an opportunity for people to see things that may prove this, uh, uh, the, the alternative vision of freedom in, a, in the Constitution, a reality again, such as the Ron Paul campaign. But the point, the point uh, what I'm doing is starting a national movement to restore the republic. We have an e-newsletter that's coming out in April. Uh, that will be a focal point identifying specific instances of government abuse in the bureaucracy, the executive branch, Congress that violate the Constitution, specific means by which to protest those uh, actions. And then also we're going to demand that uh, elected representatives agree to a platform that will result in a restoration of the, of the republic and a restoration of the Constitution. Where can people and sign up for that e-newsletter at emord.com? Yeah, it'll be it'll be through emore.com. It'll also be restoretherepublic.co, co, okay. and it's under construction right now. But April one, uh, it'll be available, and and we're going to try to create this national movement and push very strongly for the specific purpose of restoring the republic, restoring the constitutional principles and uh, limits on government power, and removing from office those members of Congress and the Senate who are derelict in their responsibilities of upholding their oath of office office in the Constitution. So we're moving in that direction. I think that, that as the crisis continues, as uh, circumstances worsen with the debt, as circumstances worsen and, and make it apparent to virtually every American that they're not going to get Social Security, they're not going to have, as, as, uh, uh, as uh, Reed has promised, Social Security as we know it. It's just not going to exist. It cannot be afforded by this government. And Medicare and Medicaid have to change. The, 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 the need is to ensure that those who are dependent upon these systems are transitioned into a private environment where companies take on the responsibility of caring and supporting uh, those who are incapable of caring for themselves. And that can be done if the government will give a, a $1.50 tax deduction for every $1 that a company expends to assist in providing medical care, to assist in providing uh, retirement benefits and so forth for those who are uh, indigent. You know, and there's no reason why this can't happen. It's so easy, actually, in America to solve the health care problem. All we have to do is stop poisoning everybody, get the fluoride out of the water, get the GMOs out of the food, get the, the toxic pesticides out of the food, get the, the additives. I mean, we're being poisoned. And if you take that away, health care costs drop. I know that's a separate issue from what you mentioned. We've only got a, about a minute left before the break, Jonathan. But uh, can you talk about Ron Paul writing the intro for your book very, very quickly? How did, you get, how did you get Ron Paul to do that? He's a busy guy these days. Well, I, I work 
rather regularly with their office. I've drafted several pieces of legislation for his office. And uh, in the course of discussing my, my plans to write this book, I was surprised pleasantly uh, when they offered to uh, write the foreword. All right. Well, uh, stay, will you stay with us one, one more segment there, Jonathan? We've got sure. more questions for you and for those listening. This is an interview with Jonathan Emord here on The Alex Jones Show. Thank you for staying with us. We'll be right back after this break with more from Jonathan E. Mord, author of Restore the Republic. Stay with us. We're back with Jonathan E. Mord, author of Restore the Republic, a very important new book that lays out a pathway to actually protecting the future of freedom in America. Jonathan E. Mord joins us by phone to continue that discussion. Jonathan, uh, we were talking about solutions and what people can do right now, what activists can do right now. That's what people are hungry for. They want to be part of a solution. They don't want to see this country just fail and collapse into total destruction. Uh, continue along those lines, please. What, what can people do right now to be part of the solution? Well, we're creating this e-newsletter as a focal point to identify each of the specific instances where the administration, the, the bureaucracy, Congress, the executive branch deviates from the requirements of the Constitution, violates the Constitution, and also on this fiscal irresponsibility, identifying specific measures that threaten to destroy the country and to advocate reform. Uh, and to do so both with the uh, support of, of politicians, identifying politicians to support who are in favor of, of the principles that we articulate, which are in favor of the Constitution, and to attack those who are not, and also to demand uh, that specific changes be made to alter the course of this government into a constitutional direction. So it's an ongoing thing. It's a monthly e-newsletter. We're looking to create a movement to restore the republic. We're using that rubric, restore the republic, to identify all those people in this country who are advocates of the Constitution, asking them to come on board and help us in this movement to do this. We're hoping to get large numbers of people behind the movement and to become a, a critical voice in the evolution of this country. And the book Restore the Republic is an ambitious undertaking on my part, but I, I have identified the means to eliminate the federal government's uh, cost to, ex to an extent that would permit a balanced budget by de eliminating several federal departments, several federal agencies, and taking Medicare, Social Security, and Medicaid and privatizing it so that those who are dependent upon those systems are covered by tax deductions given in to, the, to corporations, uh, enabling them to provide this largesse in lieu of the government. Okay, Basically, I'm the whole system is to empower individuals and depower the federal government. All right, that, that makes perfect sense. And right now I'm going to pledge to you some software technology. I, you know, I founded a software company almost 20 years ago that can handle sending out a very large volumes of emails to opt-in subscribers. So I'd like to donate that to your organization and help support your message to bring you subscribers. You'll need good technology to send out email to millions of people, which I'm sure this will grow to. Let me also give you the Rick Perry quiz. Can you name three government agencies to eliminate? <laughs> Very easy. Take the food, uh, the Federal Communications Commission. It can be privatized. There's no reason why the government should own the airwaves. It can, can be, be complete private system. We can take the Federal Food and Drug Administration and we can eliminate its drug approval process and its medical device approval process by making that a university-based system and having a blinded system of review take place at the universities, which is presumptively a determination of safety and efficacy. We can eliminate the Environmental Protection Agency. There's absolutely no reason why local Local health and safety can't protect us from environmental pollutants and going after companies that are responsible for trespass or otherwise uh, disturbing the environment. We can eliminate the Department of uh, uh, Commerce. There's no reason why we should have a Department of Commerce, really. Why should the federal government be involved in that? We can eliminate the Department of Education and very well should because the Department of Education is a federal system that's destroying education in this country. What we need are more private incentives in education. Well, right, what Those the, are just the, a few. The big government People like to say, well, how can you be against education? How can you be against the environment? You're not. Actually, the Department of Education is anti-education. The EPA is anti-environment. The FDA is anti-health. I mean, that's the and issue. And the Department of Energy is anti-energy. Yeah, we need <laughs> to get rid of the Department of Energy as well. But there are many listed in the book precisely how it can be done and the cost savings that come from eliminating them. All right. Stay with us if you would. We'll go into a quick break. We'll be right back with more with Jonathan Emord, author of Restore the Republic. Please stay with us, Jonathan. Straight ahead.